not just another Sheffield Wednesday podcast. I'm one of the hosts, Richard Miller. I'm my co-host. Well, just a peek behind the curtain, folks. Uh, we're recording this podcast in two halves because, frankly, 8pm on a Sunday is a ridiculous time to play a football match. Um, so <laughs> a podcast of two halves really requires a host of two halves. He's sweet, but he's salty. He's spicy, but drinks mild. He's a bit like that Alanis Morissette song. He's got one hand in his pocket and the other one is also in his pocket because it's bloody freezing. Dr. Luke Gledel, how are you doing? I'm good. I'm good, Rich. <laughs> how are you today? How are you? Not too bad. Not too bad. Yes. So, yeah, we're doing a bit. We're, we're, this is prep. <laughs> this is pre-match warm-up. And then uh, we, will, we will record the, the sort of match breakdown hot on the heels of uh, probably losing to Everton. But uh, I suppose we we shouldn't make predictions like that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Before we get into any proceedings, Rich, um, we've got another great sponsor that we're looking to plug on the, uh, the podcast. So folks, looking to spice things up inside and outside your ladies' box? Well, Adam Reach and Eve is here for you, listeners. That's right. Everyone's favorite young Wednesday wing sensation takes his long range screamer talents to cause some short range screamers in the bedroom through his new online sex toy emporium. Fancy the talents of Adam Reach's magic wand of a left peg around you, you or your partner's clitoris. There's a toy for that. Some delicate feather toys as delicate as Reach Unio's touch. We've got them. Want some fuzzy can cuffs that offer enough enticing, trusting, comforting, and delicious sexiness as when he signed his mahusive five-year contract and joining the owls? Well, once again, they have you covered like cheese on a palmo. Adam Reach and Eve .com, hitting that goal spot on a more consistent basis than Adam Reach does this season. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Incredible. And is there any sort of deal if uh, people... Yes, of course. If you sign up today and uh, use use the code GRAVYSHILLS, you'll get 20% off your first order. Oh, my goodness. I mean, often Adam Reach has made me feel things in my downstairs area, but it's nice to put a formal factor on that and also be able to pay him directly for the pleasure. That's a, that's a real treat. There we go. Uh, <laughs> Thanks so much for that, Luke. I think um, I, I've I, I've made a note to mark this episode as explicit. Very early doors. <laughs> Breaking hoo hoos. Breaking hoo hoos. Uh, what a week! Um, it's not been that much of a week, has it? Let's be honest. Uh, <laughs> this is first off the heart of the press. Uh, news to me, maybe not news to you, Luke, but. Andre Green, new signing, mm. new new Wednesday winger. He has branded initials online, like Roger Federer or Tiger Woods. Interesting. Did you did you know we we were in the company of such a an incredible talent? I I did I did not know this at all. Yeah, this was part of his because he did a Q and A, which seemed mm -hmm. to be part, sort of supported by his agent and him and the club. And finally, kind of edited into a slightly too long video on on Instagram. And did you watch the entirety of that? Because I only watched the first minute before doing other things of my life. Sadly, I did watch all of it. I don't know why. I was really kind of a bit kind of bored and fed up within that same minute. But I, I then <laughs> invested some time, and I wanted to see it through to the end. I, I wondered if there might be, you know, a Shamalian or Shamalamian twist towards the end where. I don't know what might happen, but the ground might swallow up Andre Green. And, you know, you just don't know what's going to happen. I particularly, I watched it. It was long enough for me to get quite annoyed at the fact that there was a weird high-pitched fan type noise in the background of Andre Green answering the questions. But they didn't play that noise whilst they were showing you the tweet that he was answering. So you kind of had the blissful silence. Do you know that relief when there's an annoying noise and then it goes away and you can like, feel and hear the the absence of it mm. it basically was that for six minutes <laughs> blessed pause in 
and then it coming back along with fairly tedious answers to questions. Uh, but good to see Barry good at football. Aston Villa are a big club, so Sheffield Wednesday. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. So big groundbreaking revelations to be had with interviewing Andre Green. Oh yeah, big noise. It was a big noise. It was worth um, definitely worth. The this is the problem. Like that, you know, well, it's, it's not a, a, that big a problem. But I'm just saying, for my fascination. No, don't. Please don't don't downsize this problem. Big big problem. Go for it. Big like, I don't big know problem. Huge huge. Did anyone ask him what he's been doing for the past four or five months? <laughs> There was a question about how he stayed sharp or something, but it was a very, it was a very vague sort of answer. He's been, he's learned the piano is what he's done in his time off. <laughs> so really? we, we may have a, a winger whose talents are on the wane in that field, but um, you know, in time he could be quite a tunesmith on that, on that old Joanna. So, you know, not all, not all lost. Um, so <laughs> moving on from that, that bit of news, we, we have a signing and we've given a first senior contract to Callum Huxley, nickname Aldous. Uh, and we've entered a brave new world with this signing. <laughs> Very good, Rich. Very good. I like how that's the only thing you could actually write about him, to be fair. <laughs> he had some link with Wrexham previously. There you go. There you go. I don't know. I mean, well, let's see. We, you know, young players are getting getting some chances. Maybe the fact he's been given a contract means that the uh, the COVID situation hasn't got any better at the uh, at the club, and he's going to make an appearance in the in the FA Cup for us. Um, at least fill out a couple of bench slots with uh, with signing new uh, new youngsters. Just just one question, Rich. Do you reckon that he will be the the soma of our young? Young wing. <laughs> yes. Yeah. We'll all forget about our, our troubles the everyday. We'll we'll drift away due to due to Soma. It's a good book that though. You know, in terms of uh, dystopian futures, nineteen eighty four gets gets a lot of play, doesn't it? But um Brave New World is probably has as many hits as as uh, as as nineteen eighty four in terms of things it got right about a uh, a, dyst- a, dyst- a dystopian future and i think probably a better read for me personally maybe that's a controversial thing to say but there you go naturally orwellian troubles big brother being watched all the time transfer talk there's been some transfer talk luke you want to you want to take us through the headlines in that regard sure so we are recording this i'm sure this could probably pop through by the time we get to talking about the everton game on sunday night but Looks like Sam Hutchinson is edging ever closer to being a Sheffield Wednesday player again. What does that what does that evoke in you, feelings wise, Luke? That's a good question, Rich. I think it just it doesn't really add anything to add anything or detract from the pile of apathy that I have towards <laughs> uh, my beloved Sheffield Wednesday right now. It it really just pans into that conversation we had last week where it's like, where, where should we improve? And I'm like, I don't know. Mm. It, it all feels so much, <laughs> such a level of shit show that it, any number of bodies is fine. You know, I, I'm a bit, I'm a bit skeptical. It's not a, it's not a long-term answer for a short-term process in an area we're struggling. Sure. I don't know. It's, it's kind of cute. It has a bit of Disney chops about it, right? Yeah, I I forgot um, what what Disney film is it again where the the Cockney wide boy comes in and kicks some people for a while in a different t-shirt. It's Mulan. Mulan, yes, yeah, famously problematic. <laughs> I just let's just look at the so the narrative of Hodge. I know there's like there's rumors and myths of rumors and you know all the <laughs> the speculation about what you know what's real what's not but on the face of it so this cannot be a chancery chancery has not got an issue with Hutchinson presumably because he's come into from the cold a couple of times on a, mm-hmm. on a kind of personal basis and then this would be the most just you know you don't re-sign a player there are other people that can play the role of, <laughs> I suppose it goes without saying, but Sam Hutchinson is not the only man that can play like Sam Hutchinson. 
I'm sure he may be one of very few that is available, interested and willing to do the job for the for whatever wage he ends up getting. But if you were if you were in sort of active disagreement with somebody, you wouldn't bring them back to the football club. So let's take Chancery out of that as a as a factor. Mm. Hutch has had under two different coaches now, or two different managers, first team coaches, whatever they were called. He's had periods where he's been out because of personal, you personally falling out with the person in charge of the football club. Mm. That's a, it's a strange character to bring back in. It's a strange, almost sort of addiction to bring him back in again. But, but I suppose yeah, if we take all the, oh, so go on. It's this reliance on the mentality of, you know, these are fixtures in the Sheffield Wednesday dressing room. You know, it's yeah. it's almost like looking and saying, these are players that, you know, seemingly, not that we all do because so many of us are, are grown men and this this would be kind of against. But it, it's kind of a weird mentality to say Chanziri thinks that every fan has a poster of these players on their wall, you know? <laughs> a tattoo on our heart. Exactly. It's but again. It's it's been like, hey, we need a rebirth. We need to regenerate. We need to go younger with the squad. We need to turn over. You know, we need to move on from this era. But we can't. We seemingly have an addiction to these. <laughs> it's your reference to when we chatted, I think, a couple of weeks ago, and talking about the old flames. Yes. Yeah. It's drastic. It's it's really. I don't know because I mean I can see a lot of positives. To Hutchinson coming back. Well, that's what I was. Yeah, that's what I was sort of turning a corner into. Was take take all of the <laughs> the 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 you know the added extras, the noise, the outside stuff away, and we have hopefully a capable, motivated defensive midfielder with some champion mm. with championship experience. Who apparently, if we believe his PR, you know, loves you know adores the club. Loves the club. Yeah, the club and would have gladly retired here and seen his career out. I, I'm just worried that we've obviously, like you said, had two previous managers who said him and Westwood are damaging to the dressing room and part of the reason why it's this club is rotten to the core. Mm. They've ostracized them and then they've been brought back in. It just feels like the dressing room always wins. It does, and it, it, it's... <sighs> I get it's it's so hard to separate <laughs> the the politics from the football in in the case of Hotch and Westwood to an extent, but um, this is a dressing room that is producing worse and worse results year on year. But they, yeah, they seem to hold the sway, and it, it's also interesting. Because one of the reasons supposedly it's difficult now to get a new man in to the managerial position is that uh, Chinsiri wants to have a say over first team matters. Too much of a say, in the opinion of several sort of outsiders looking in. And is one of the says he wants to have that he wants Sam Hutchinson to be there and involved with diminishing returns. It's a, I don't know. It's it is hard to look at it just on its face, but on its face we've got this. We've got someone who should have some years left. He's had big periods of his life where he's not played huge amounts of football. We know he's got kind of underlying. At any moment, it could be the last game for Sam Hutchinson. But yeah, he's also. You sometimes get this. I know I do probably too many comparisons to combat sports, but occasionally there was a there was a fight um, last weekend where it was the young pretender against the old guy that's been champ and is maybe on the way down. Mm. And the champ who's on his way down is 29 years old and the young pretender is 32. You know, like battle scars and battle weariness and mileage all have a factor to play. And the fact is that Sam Hutchinson at whatever age he is, 32, 31, 32, has probably has played a lot less football than many of his peers. So if it's a case of kind of getting worn out or worn down in some ways, <laughs> there's 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 potentially a fair amount still on the clock, you know, to go back to your kind of old banger that you run into the ground. He's a long way from that. Mm. But it just feels it it feels so much closer. And I mean especially for Sam Hutchinson who seems such a big character, the thing that you know maybe I've been quite detrimental towards Sam Hutchinson 
it was weird because I mean Sam Hutchinson was a mention in our kind of team of the decade. I'm not sure if he kind of made the cut for the first eleven was an honorable mention. And it seemed at that point when we were talking about this coming into 2020, for looking back at that team of the decade, it felt like he was beginning to be on the wane and be on like kind of pushed out. We'd had the previous kind of dramatics regarding Yoss, him coming back in and doing a little mustache to the crowd. Yes. You know, I, I've maybe been damning and detrimental. He's been a very solid professional for us for a long time. Not quite as prime and as pomp, but also you kind of look under the hood and you chat to him and he seems like a character who's, you know, has suffered from mental health issues. Mm-hmm. As a lot of us are, but it, it's just, it's refreshing to hear someone talk about that in a, you know, a professional footballing capacity, which doesn't kind of lift its lid on its demons that often or... Oh talk about things in such an open kind of manner so that is to be promised but it's just it feels like we're driving down the motorway in our in our you know trusty reliable second-hand car but how trusty and reliable is it we feel like the engine could fall out at any minute well it's almost got a kind of (laughs) speed-esque unbeknownst to you there is like an immediate off switch, which will have a pretty dramatic impact at any given moment with uh, with Sam Hutchinson. That's yeah, it's it's a reliable old clodder of a of a car, but then also if it goes less than fifty, <laughs> it will blow up. Um, Who else so would it, you recast in that? Do you think would would Stuart Gray play Sandra Bullock? As oh, such? if only as such. <laughs> may be a bomb under the car but it doesn't fear us and you know I used to say it doesn't fear us which I thought was a, such a lovely strange turn of phrase um I didn't know <laughs> I didn't know Stuart Gray sound it was uh, Alan Alan Bennett <laughs> oh he is actually I'm having a wonderful oh, time at Fulham looks, football club I looked under the bonnet and it was full of custard creams we're, we're, we're getting planets for our performances, but our uh, results remain underwhelming. So I don't know. I... So, so, I, I, so here's my theory. Mm. <laughs> this is my, in a, in a world where we choose our truth and, um, you know, there's no such thing as fact. It's all just spurious nonsense one way or another. I suspect, so Sam Hutchinson has good relations with several people at the club. Probably, let's be honest, he's got good relationships with the chairman and maybe old stuffing boy. And that is enough to leave a leave a window ajar or a door open. And Sam Hutchinson's made a big move to Greece. I'm going Pephos, mate. I'm, it's going to be great. Lovely son. And maybe the family don't like it. Maybe maybe Sam doesn't like it. He certainly didn't seem to like that person that he murdered in the clip that we saw. And so maybe he's still got a house in Sheffield and he still feels he's got something to give. And maybe, you know, he's in conversation or he calls up the club and says and intimates basically... I'm not on much here. I came over because it's Greece and it's a bit nice. Maybe I get to beat Brexit, but everyone's miserable. I'd like to come back. We've still got the house in Sheffield, so I'd like to come back to Sheffield. I'll do I'll I'll play for what I'm on at Paphos or I'll pay oh you know, I'll play for very little or whatever. And from the club's point of view, that's a fairly probably becomes a fairly simple decision to make. Take take the emotion, take the character stuff out of the way. As we touched on, this is an experienced championship midfielder. We're light in defensive midfield. We, we've played, Joey Pelopesi has played an, as many games this half of the season as he did in the whole of the last season. It, he was probably not intended to be <laughs> um, a first team player. You can't imagine that that was the, the choice, but that's become what's happened because of Luongo's injuries, because of whatever, whatever other circumstances. So, you drop somebody in, he's probably going to be considerably better than Pelipesi. He's certainly much better at driving us forward from that position than Pelipesi is. So uh, on some level, you could just say it's a bit of a no-brainer. But it it is a bit depressing and it's a bit going back to <laughs> yesterday's dinner. It's the leftovers. It's a bit, you know, yeah. you should eat it because it saves you some money. It's the economical efficient thing to do but 
getting a pizza in would be much more exciting. It would. <laughs> um, we've also been linked with a couple of left backs. Um, well, actually, I think it's just one. Oh, okay. So that is what's this chap? It is Pickering from Crew. It's apparently quite a highly rated young left back in League One. It's about 22. Um, I think Blackburn Rovers are heavily, heavily kind of in for him right now. Mm. So, yeah, Harry Pickering. It's a good name. It is a great name. It is a great name. So it, it's interesting to, to see his try for a lower league player who's of good credentials. He's he obviously has come up from the Crew Academy. Yeah. Um, you'd be glad to know he was born in Chester, Rich. Oh, good. Like like a lot of good people. Yeah. Like a lot of great people we know. A Cestrian. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I don't know. I don't know if that's something that's going to go ahead, but it's it's oddly promising to be linked with such players and to have in, have an interest into them. So we'll see if anything develops there. Yeah, and that, and this is we've got we've had this from the sort of the local press. It's it's sort of a couple of other journalistic types on Twitter have sort of borne it out as well. Yeah, as you say, it's this is the sort of player that we sort of hoped this was the corner we were turning and the sort of player we were going to be chasing after. Mm. Um, there's interest from Blackburn. There's interest from Stoke, who are obviously teams in better positions than us. Mm. But I would imagine if we're going to play any sort of normal defence, the left back spot is kind of his to take if he if he joins Wednesday. I don't True. know whether that's the piece at those other clubs. I mean, certainly at mm. Stoke, he'll be he'll be vying for the same position as Morgan Fox, who we know is a very uh, decent player. Mm-hmm. Uh, so how many games he's guaranteed to get, I don't know. And there is obviously um, there is obviously one transfer link that I've just remembered, just recalled from this week, which is um, brother of Jakob, Josh Murphy at Cardiff. Yes. Yeah. The other Jay Murphy. The other Jay Murphy. Hoping to, we're basically hoping to replace like for like, basically. And the nice thing is they look so similar. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) It's funny that, isn't it, Rich? (laughs) Maybe, um, maybe seen as they get so, uh, Josh is getting such such little uh, game time for a dour and um, miserable Newcastle side. Maybe they could do a kind of sitcom esque swap, where the one that you know, whichever one's feeling most up for it, can come and play for us and start at the weekend, and the one that's maybe been out on the lash or you know not slept particularly well can turn up at Newcastle and play for five minutes near the end. We can kind of get the, be- the best of both worlds. A sort of brother-brother, if you will. <laughs> yes, yeah. Oh, go home, Roger. <laughs> that was that one, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. I know, it was. I know it things. Was. Yeah. Um, yeah, th- th- I mean, I would be... It's nice that we're, we are looking in areas, you know, with the signing of uh, Hoxley, we're, we're looking at those wide areas where we are short of, of options. Um, Odebadjo's kind of played every single position um, out of the, the four wide positions uh, most commonly used with, you know, interesting effects in each. And I think Reach has done the same and probably Harris has done the same. But it, it all kind of seems to be done to occlude the fact that we we're probably one or two players short in that position from where we need to be. None of this speaks particularly signing a left back or potentially signing a left back, signing another left winger, uh, looking to bring in another winger on loan. None of this bodes particularly well for Matt Penny, who just seems to can't seem to get going. Mm-hmm. Really. Mm-hmm. He might be a player that comes good in time. I think there's enough to his game uh, that that's a possibility. I don't think it's a given. I've seen I've seen good stuff and and poorer stuff. I know there's a nice um, somebody's sort of gathered together a nice statistic that when he starts we've done really well. But that's such a small number of games that that counts for that it, it, it could easily be skewed by just one result one way or another. But do, how do you feel? I mean, how do you feel about the potential of of other people coming in and and kind of taking his 
is even even as they are scant opportunities uh, of of first team appearances from him. Uh, how does that how does that sit with you? I don't know with Matt Penny. No, I I, I apologise for just the sheer level of apathy that I have with talking about the the makeup of the squad. It just feels everything is so uncertain. You know, we're in a pretty treacherous position in the league. Derby won today. That kind of extends the the gap from safety to about five points now. Granted, we have games in hand. So the Rotherham Noah brothers, there's no sign of a manager. That is something that needs to have a decision made at some point. Mm. The rumblings seem to be still, though, that as we've had no games until, you know, the FA Cup game tomorrow, which we'll review as part of this episode, which is almost like a free hit, really. I mean, Everton will probably be playing a strong lineup. They want to progress. Difficult to know who's available after the COVID outbreak. It's difficult to know. There's always various shades of an injury crisis at Sheffield Wednesday. Yeah. Everything is just so incredibly uncertain. We don't know. You know, uh, Barry Bannon mentioned actually that he's very, very keen to sign a new contract. Um, He just alluded to the fact that Chancery is out of the country. So that kind of puts a hold up on proceedings, but something he's hoping to do soon. But again, in and of itself, that's a daft position to be in, isn't it? It is, but we're constantly in this position. I don't know. I was thinking the other day, you know, hey, if I was if I was Sheffield Wednesday chairman, why not a little daydream kind of down the rabbit hole for myself there? Yeah. I'd want to have some stability with the players. And with, hey, these are sign that you know, these are these are prospects, these are players with future, they play with resale value. We're very bad at keeping to people to long, lengthy contracts. It seems weird that we have Chancery has this mentality of a family. And yet, no one seems to be tied to sticking around till <laughs> any time in the near future. You know, he, 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 everyone's family, but he doesn't let them know whether they're coming to Christmas dinner or not until like the twenty fourth. <laughs> yes, exactly. So we we've, we've got all these young players who are on the cusp of potentially leaving the club and having futures elsewhere if they do have futures. Matt Penny is one of them. We we've not we've never seen. Irihide's had a nasty injury. He's never come back. I think bar some youth games, I don't think we've heard any great sniff of him. He's never had an appearance around the first team. Um, Alex Hunt has felt like the season he would break through. That's mm. not really happened. We've had Shaw in his place now. But again, yeah. now we're in a position of, are we, are we keeping Liam Shaw? Can we please keep Liam Shaw? Can we get him a new contract, please? Yes, yes. And that's uh, gone a little bit quiet, which is a little bit frustrating. There's just, there's no, there's no stability. So there's no, there's no base to build on. So I don't know how we keep adding players. Andrew Green signed for 18 months, which is nice. Okay. That is some... Everything's, everything <laughs> is just so short term. Yeah. Yeah, it is. Uh, and it, it, it just, it, it's hard to shake the feeling that we just sort of drift from one mini disaster to the next one panicked situation to another there does there's no doesn't seem to be any forward thinking any yeah yeah it's um th- even this with the managerial situation you know saying that oh this this is a free shot against everton but also <laughs> this is a week of training that, that's been missed we go into we're so close to a february which is crazy in terms of the schedule that we've got laid out ahead of us do we drop do we parachute a man in at some point during that we we've we've pretty much we're now a week away from sort of missing the opportunity of getting somebody in ahead of that run of games and um apologies to whoever posted or said this maybe it's not a particularly original thought but we've all heard managers moan Oh, we don't really get any time on the training pitch because we're we're match to match, and February will be match to match. Mm. So anybody anybody new will not have any time to train those players really, because it will all be recovery on a punishing routine of Saturday, Tuesday, Saturday, Tuesday, and I think there might be one Saturday, Wednesday in there. We can't afford to give that up. So I I, I would rather if we're not going to get somebody new in, let's give Thompson a bit of security. So that he at least feels he's working for something. Mm-hmm. 
And the, the, probably the last bit of news worth touching on is the fact that um, Mick McCarthy has, um, we've managed to dodge a Mick McCarthy shaped disaster to add into the rest of this season's uh, brushes as he he's ended up at Cardiff City. Uh, would you have taken Mick? I don't know. I think his stock was higher previously. He did good. Thing. I mean, it was incredible what he, in a way, what he achieved with Ipswich, wasn't it? It was. He got them punching far above their weight. I mean, I, I kind of laugh because it's not a very glamorous appointment for Cardiff City. But then maybe it's that's what they know. It's what they know. I know it's it's again. So you've you've basically created a base of Warnock football, and then you brought in Neil Harris, who's quite similar, and then. You know, it's it's Mick McCarthy. It's like the negative version of like Southampton. You know, we <laughs> yeah. have a we have a philosophy and way of playing. So we just go <laughs> get we go get the next guy who can do the same stuff the old guy did. <laughs> but maybe maybe that's oddly genius. I but I I don't know. Maybe uh, here at Cardiff City, we have a deep seated philosophy at the club. It it out it outweighs. Uh, the time of managers and players. What we do is we play the football in equivalent of a drizzly Sunday, and we bore the opposition into submission, and we might sneak a goal. And that's what Cardiff City has always stood for. <laughs> oh dear, it's not particularly inspiring, is it? I think. No, it isn't. But maybe, maybe it could be. I don't know. It could work two ways. It's not a glamorous appointment. Um, it's not a change in it's not a change in philosophy, but maybe that's a good thing. Yeah. I don't know. But then again, it it felt a bit weird. It felt like, you know, it reminded me of when Huddersfield sacked Wag Wagner. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> pronounce his name. The oh. guy from the guy from X Factor. Yeah, yeah, that guy. That, that guy. guy. <laughs> and then they they didn't they go and get the assistant manager at Bayern. Or the other yeah. 23 coach at Bayern. And it felt like, why did you just get rid of David Wagner yeah. to get this other guy? Who's just, there's a weird mentality. There's a weird mentality between how much of this is actual change and how much of this is just a symbolic, purely changing of the guard because yeah. the guy was struggling. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and maybe that is unfortunately a cycling within managerial appointments. It, so it could be a good, it's a very much a Schrodinger's, Schrodinger's Cardiff. Um, it could be a good appointment. It could be a bad appointment. I don't think I'd want him at Wednesday. No, no, I, I, I agree. I'm not, Previously, I, was... I would have, but I think that was probably before a time when, you know, we had to sit through so much Gary Monk and so much um, Tony Pulis, or so little Tony Pulis, but it felt like... Well, that's, that's philosophy-wise, we're... We're a club that espouses <laughs> an attacking philosophy. And I think we had that under Carlos in the first season, maybe, but he certainly became much more defensive in the second season. And in, in the third, it, it, to a fault, we were defensive. We then, to correct Carlos, we appointed a, def a, a an outright defensive ma manager in Yosla Hukai to to play attacking football. Then Steve Bruce, who I think he mixes and matches, but I think what the sort of football Bruce is churning out at Newcastle is, is pretty much his stock and trade. Tight at the back, counter-attacking, but pretty kind of meat and potatoes. You know, it's not, it's not, um, you are not getting total football from a, from a Brucey team, I would imagine. So another kind of pragmatic manager that we, claimed you know we claimed would play attacking football for us monk to be honest i didn't know what monk was like prior to joining us but very little of what he produced felt like exciting front foot football and then we appointed the ultimate well to use the word again pragmatist in 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 tony pulis and again sort of seemingly expected him to change his spots and and I feel like Mick McCarthy would just be another in that long line of what have you done you know you've had a, a relatively storied managerial career what how what's got you there well yeah come here and do the opposite and if you don't do the opposite I'll be a bit upset with you that feels like the stupidest philosophy to have <laughs> if it's if it is a philosophy yeah uh, 
anyway, um, that's it for the news section. We will now talk about the weekend's match with Everton. So we're on to the cup match with Everton away at Goodison Park. And I think, to be honest, the first thing when I saw the team sheet, just felt like there was a lot of familiar first team type faces missing. Mm. Was that your sort of shared experience? Well, I mean, so other official media sources will have no qualms of being professional and not gesticulating who could have had the vid. But here in Different Gravy, we'll get right into it. Yeah. But well, seriously. That's it. So, <laughs> I mean, right. you know, yeah, that's, that's my first note was, you mm. know, is this is this the cup or is it COVID? Because mm. it's not it's not strange to play a second or a weakened team in the cup. We've done it previously. Sure. If you're um, marketing a if you're marketing a product, would you say you can't believe it's not the cup or it's can't believe it's not COVID? <laughs> Which one would you go for? I can't believe the FA Cup got COVID. Full to the brim of COVID is the FA Cup. <laughs> it's like a Pandora's box in that trophy. Once you lift the lid on the FA <laughs> Cup, all the vid got out. It's COVID all the way down. In fact, I've never seen <laughs> I've never seen the FA Cup and Wuhan in the same room. Exactly. Mm. <laughs> so so, so that was, I think that was the thing. Look at because uh, there's a bit of you know there's a, it's hard to know where the squad is at at the moment because obviously we've had this week off. We were missing yeah. prior to that. We were missing a few players through injury. Hmm. You know, Dunkley and Westwood sort of being prime amongst them, and obviously Luongo. And uh, none of those three involved today. So is that mm-hmm. is that because they're still injured? Is that because? I mean. It's interesting because I, the last time we look at this is the last line that we have to compare is literally the last round of the FA Cup. Yeah. It, it, that's probably happened through replays before where a team has played a replay and then they've gone to play the next round pretty much as soon as possible after that for the next game. But I mean, I, I think that's an interesting thing for the history books that we've played two rounds proper on the spin. Back thanks to, to back. yeah, back to back. It's, it's insane. So it's interesting. I actually went and pulled the Exeter lineup and I mean, there's only three changes. People say we don't do any preparation for this, but you know, you've you've pulled that lineup. So c- silence, doubters. Okay, sorry, just <laughs> just dropping a few truth bombs. You know? We know that our podcast is the first to bend time and space to get feedback live from people, so we can just be like, <laughs> shut up, shut shut at you. Did you have the, sorry, just quickly, on your feed, did you have the weirdly sort of creepy level of crowd noise that they were piping in on BT? Like it almost sounded like five or six schoolgirls. It didn't, it's, it was really weird. It's like, you know, this is eight o'clock. We're, we're, we're mimicking the, what a crowd would be like, but let's be honest, yeah. this is eight o'clock on a Sunday. So so yours, yours was like the first ever One Direction gig when they were just getting going, basically. Yeah. But, yeah but... There, was, there was only five or six schoolgirls there to, to shout. They didn't know if it was going to be something that they should be screaming and <laughs> getting, getting a bit het up about. So it was very interesting. Yeah. yeah, somewhere between that One Direction gig and the sort of creepy twins in The Shining, that's where, that was the sort of eerie level that I was getting from this crowd noise. I didn't get that. I just had the um, had the raw everybody shouting each other noise, which I'm kind of getting uh, used to, so it's not stressing me out as much as it has done previously on the podcast. Oh, I would have killed for that, Luke. <sighs> to hear, like, Bullen saying, push up, or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> So go on, lineup wise. Um, the three that are missing mm. are basically Alex Hunt, um, yeah. Liam Shaw, and Moses Adebayo. Yeah. Of which comes in Burner at the back to replace Shaw. Um, who replaced in the middle of the? Well, no, because I mean, it was a slightly different formation, wasn't it? Because kind of, I guess kind of Green replaced him in the. I don't, yeah. So you've probably gone with less in midfield to go Green up top effectively yeah kind of that's kind of the mentality and then Adebayo misses out for Urihide which is kind of kind of almost like for like from what I recall from those games and I mean that's interesting because I mean Adebayo 
previously we did have an era of him being cast to the sidelines for a for a hide. Mm-hmm. Like there was, I definitely remember there was that was the time, where... wasn't it? It was it was this time last year. Mm. Regide sort of emerged mm-hmm. and, and it was a surprise inclusion. And that was the, the time where we got the the rumour that Odebajo had been told, basically, you're not wanted, you can go. Yes, yes. So, yeah, yeah, you're right. That sort of almost, I mean, it, it, as I say, it's almost a year to the day that that sort of period coincides with each other. Urihide's appearance into the what which you know was barnstorming two games and then two bad games. It mm. felt a bit like you remember that Simpsons where Bart works at the the cat house, and then Grandpa Grandpa comes in, takes his hat <laughs> off, puts on the thing, sees Bart, and then turns around, takes puts it back on, and leaves. <laughs> yes, that yes. is Urihide's Sheffield Wednesday career for nineteen twenty in a gif, <laughs> basically. <laughs> And maybe, maybe that's what is this year's season is going to be as well. I don't know. It's uh, hard to tell what the uh, the lasting impact will be. But uh, yeah, mm. it's sort of baffling in a way, a sort of baffling lineup because Green is thrown in straight away, gets a start. So that was, mm. I, I would say, a pleasant surprise. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, we've got to hope and presume if we've brought him in, we hope we think he's better than what we've got. So he he is a potential starter probably from the off. Obviously, time will tell whether that's right or not, but. You know, that's that's good in and of itself. Urigide is a strange choice. We've not seen him for the best part of a year. <laughs> um, no, and I've, I've barely seen his name. Be- his name's barely been uttered in under-23 games. Yeah, yeah. Nice to see Berner back in. Mm-hmm. Um, obviously, we've got to see Galvin, another another appearance from Galvin as well. Yeah, so it's kind of intriguing. But as you say, the, the main thing you're sort of looking and going, okay... Why, I, I, to be honest, weirdly now, in this bizarre season, the first name you you miss is Shaw. Yes, because he's become yes. a pretty essential figure for the for the club, whether it's at the back or in midfield. Definitely, best the best player of the last the last month, effectively. So I think probably in 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 no particular order. You know, you're looking and thinking, well, Shaw, Shaw's missed out, Odebadjo's missed out, Lee's Dunkley. And Westwood all missed out, mm. and, and and roads nowhere to be seen either. So it's it, yeah, you wonder, which is an interesting thing because yeah, it, you don't know whether they're taking a you know whether they've been infected and it's to a person an individual experience and maybe hitting them hard. We've not yeah. had any great window of the training ground being back up and running for just over a week. I want to say it was a yeah. week last Friday, wasn't it? So yes, who knows who's been there, who's been partaking to what level. We also don't know whether people have picked up any minor or even major injury setbacks just on the training ground. Or, you know, maybe they were having a Marcus Tudgay barbecue. <laughs> yes. You know, and st- stepped on some glass or something, something like that. You know, it could be all manner of things that were seemingly in the dark from. Yeah, it's intriguing. I know obviously we'll get a fuller picture as the week rolls on because we've got Coventry on Tuesday, um, and then we've got we've got Preston on Saturday. So I, I guess we'll, as I say, we'll we'll get a um, we'll get a fuller picture as that goes through because it's not out of the question that some of those players were just simply given another week because well this mm. is a cup tie we don't have any pretense of winning this or getting into deeper stages so mm. why rush somebody back for this and and again looking back at last last year's FA Cup for those those um, almost mirror images. We we played Stephen Fletcher in that game against Brighton that Urigide made his debut in. He didn't need to play and he got injured and we basically didn't see him again at, at full fitness in a Wednesday shirt. Exactly, exactly. You could sort of argue that was one of the most pivotal decisions in the whole season, potentially. Mm-hmm. Although, obviously, you couldn't possibly know that at the time. I'm not expecting anybody to have that kind of... <laughs> foresight but why you know why take the risk if you don't have to this is a this is we are not going to win the FA Cup we will probably not get much further than the next round especially knowing that the next round is likely to be a very difficult tie against Tottenham Hotspur mm. so yeah why you don't, don't why would you force anybody into this game if you've got even a slight question mark about their fitness and we've got a massive run of games now we are back to back mm-hmm all the way through the end of 
this month and, and the whole of the next month. But I mean, interestingly, I mean, we've got to varying degrees we have, which we don't know what's happening. If again, I don't know really what's happening with Westwood, which no. kind of feels like, I mean, maybe it could be, maybe I, I really hope very, very few of them have been infected with the COVID outbreak. But since we know that it's happened and it's affected quite a few people. But then we know he was injured, Westwood. Westwood was already. He was. He was. Out for the COVID outbreak with a, was it an ankle injury? Oh, I don't know. Was it the groin injury when he was playing a game? He, he, you remember he, one time he pulled his groin, but did he come back from that? He did come back from that, yeah. It's interesting because it's been a day since we've come back and done the first half of this podcast and we're merging yes. it with the second half. <sighs> there's a lot of things from that, there's a lot of things that are kind of foreboding from that first half that we talk about. And the reason I say that is because I mentioned Nurahide, I'm like, I've never seen him. I don't know what's going on with him. I don't know if he's mm. been long-term injured or whether he's just been decreed that it's not his time anymore. And he had a bright start, but then he's seemingly done. He's, you know, he's we've decided that he's no longer a formidable or a decent youth player at this level. So there's that. I, you know, I talked about that thing with Sam Hutchinson, who I guess was still expecting to sign any any day, any minute now. I'm su- I'd be surprised if it wasn't announced you know, this Sunday evening that, that me and that you and I are talking this Sunday night, it could well happen. Yeah. yeah. But the thing I was saying about Hutchinson is, you know, it's not completely unknown for him to have a niggling injury that's going to set him out. And that's that kind of analogy I was using about driving down the motorway in your, in your car, which is Sam Hutchinson, but the engine can fall out at any minute. Yes. Yes. Feels very similar to Kieran Westwood. Yeah. Oh, definitely. Yeah. He's a man who's picked up many a warm up injury, which I, I don't know. You know, I don't know how serious they were, but it, it seemed to happen quite a lot in his Wednesday career. Well, the, I would say the, the almost sort of the ironic thing is he's seemingly been fit and available for the best part of three or four seasons now. He, when he was a mainstay mm. linchpin figure in the squad, he was he yeah. It felt like he was constantly one you know one slip or injury or an overexertion, a stretch or a, something away from having to go off. But then, almost all the time under Lahuka, he was available. Almost all the time under Monk, yeah. he was available. Mm-hmm. Yeah, just sort of. But then I thought that I really felt last season. The more we saw of him, the the more limited he, the, you know, getting a fuller picture of him. As as he's aging, I guess as well. To be fair, it's not you know the, the, nothing sort of set in stone. Mm. But seeing more and more of him playing, I just felt like we got to see more and more of more of his limitations. Mm. Yes, he can ping good balls forward, but also almost every other one of those, he's actually going to just hand possession to the opposition. He has a method of defending that it's very, very wholehearted. But it means if you miss it, you put your team in trouble. You're not in the position... If you go in for a big crunching tackle and you miss it or the player... Maybe you hit the player, but he moves the ball on, you've left a gap there for the team to exploit. So all mm-hmm. these things, it just felt like the more that we saw of him, the more of these gaps and drops there were. And I think that does add to the <laughs> the kind of... Um, slight feeling of you know meh about him maybe coming back but then you look at the midfield today and undoubtedly it would be improved by having Sam Hutchinson in there Hmm. well I feel so anyway but um (laughs) (laughs) well that's an interesting question I mean especially for someone like myself who's on brand not particularly a big fan of Joey Pelopesi Joey Pelopesi's had probably his best season at Sheffield Wednesday so far yeah, I think it's probably easy to say. I mean, would you would you think that? I don't know. Like right now, I don't know. I, d- I don't know right now if Sam Hutchinson is an improvement on Joe Pelopesi right now. Mm, yeah, but then I think I feel like you'd end up with a more secure midfield unit. Although uh, I don't know. Obviously, you'll you, there's no, there's a there's a sort of a factor in that three and how you make that mix of that three mm. is your gamble is your. How, how many risks are we going to take to get our foothold and get ourselves further up the field? So today we were we were sometimes at we were sometimes a three up top, but by and large, Reach was one of those three in the middle. That's what his he was sort of the the pivot at the top there of the of the three. So having him and Bannon quite attacking, 
quite risky. Mm. And then Pelopessi is is kind of your safety blanket. So I don't know whether Hutch adding Hutch in there, actually taking Hutch, putting Hutch in there for Pelopessi in that three, I think you're probably right. It's probably a more a bigger risk defensively. Mm. But if Hutch was the replacement for the one of the other two, then it gives you a more secure unit to build from, but maybe cuts down on your creativity. So there's always it's all about give and take, isn't it? And it's the risks that you take. And, and yeah. today we were very, we were cautious without the right personnel to be cautious is what I would say. I think, mm. should we, should we try and get into the game a bit? I I just wanted to say, I did see, I think a Wednesday fan was wondering that, you know, wondering if Shaw was off as a result of not seeing him in and around this team or the bench kind of picture. But I just think there's so many variables right now we just it's difficult to say it's difficult to say anything with any great certainty right there's so much uncertainty yeah. there's so many weird variables um the thing i want to say about the i mean we had like a full we had the full nine on the bench we did we filled the bench the bench is expansive as the space are taken up in the stands i said and the uh, the cup overfloweth <laughs> with second string options it's like i come around to rich's house and rich says to me do you want to roll a cola and i'm like Sure. And he said, he says, which roller color do you want? I've got all the smart, I've got all the uh, shop zone brand varieties in my fridge. I think we had Panda Pops. I think that was the one that was our kind of local mm. varietal. Yeah. I, 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 yeah. You know, we've, we've had back to back uh, FA Cup matches. Was the Everton game better than the Extra game? Well, uh, we filled the bench. You know, <laughs> That's that's a weird that's a weird kind of sad comfort to know that we're coming back out of you know this outbreak on the training ground and granted there's a lot of academy players but you know we're still seeing a lot more players back um, Marius back there Windas was there you know Izzy Brown Alex Hunt and Elias Kachunga Kachunga who I think as we yeah. understand was kind of sent home last minute last time we were out yes. so yes yeah. Well, I suppose that's the. I suppose that yeah, we. It's a bench that's full, <laughs> but then it comes down to the age-old question or problem, depending on your outlook on things. Looking at that bench, how, how many how many of those do you feel or are you confident would make a positive impact brought on for in place of one of the players that starts the game? That's always the question, isn't mm. it? So often we're looking at the bench, and you're like, well, they're all. They're either a different shade of the same type and caliber of player, mm-hmm. or they're worse. And once again, we were in a position where we made the change. We took Patterson off. I mean, oh, well, we there's not there's not many folks coming out with you know being in positive reviews from this game. But you know, you take Patterson off and bring on Brown, and he had more of the ball, but. Mm. But as you say, it feels like we're out of the woods in terms of that COVID nightmare because we can we can fill a, a team and a bench. That's that's much better than where we were. Sure, we've got a training ground that is operable. That's better than where we were. Um, I think the thing is today is that this would have been if everybody was fit and well, this would have been a ridiculously tough game of football for us. Oh, definitely, um, yeah. We're in a position where a very good Premier League team with realistic aspirations of maybe finishing in a European place this season put out their entire first team and that was always going to be an uphill battle yeah. I think the, well, the, the main change was that they had the the second string goalkeeper in who it happens to be Sweden's first choice international goalkeeper so boohoo for um for Everton's choices on the bench we have um, the South Yorkshire Samurai or the Broken Irishman those are our choices <laughs> They have two full first choice internationals to pick from. Mm -hmm. So, what did you? I mean, so obviously the game, the game sort of gets going, and I think Reach probably had the first effort in earnest. We we got a shot on target early doors, a bit Mm -hmm. of a a spicy number from from Adam Reach from distance, but obviously easy to to deal with from the goalkeeper. Then it sort of fairly quickly sank into a bit of a rhythm of them. Keeping a lot of the ball, picking their moments to attack, but I thought by and large defensively we, I thought we looked pretty 
decent most of that first half. Mostly. Um, I mean, outside of that, you know, that decent, you know, early crack from Reach, which um, was very early on. Mm. Then there was a worrying moment where Rich Allison got a header away. I thought Wildsmith did well to get a tip on it. I think he did well given the situation. I did as well, yeah. That's sort of eight minutes in, wasn't it? That sort of mark. I mean, it is probably still Joe Wildsmith, and I'll try not to lay on this damning note, but he really made it look very, very difficult. <laughs> he made <laughs> it look a lot harder than I think it was. <laughs> it was just the manner in which he did yeah, it. But Hollywood, it was still, as they say. It was a little bit, yeah. It was a, a bit, I don't know, Mel Gibson rolling underneath a uh, shutter that's falling in Lethal Weapon. It looked good. But, you know, it seemed <laughs> and good just now. like Mel Gibson, actually, interestingly, mm -hmm. Joe Wildsmith is, it has some really interesting things to say about Jews, if you ask him. Excellent. It's good to know. It's good to know. <laughs> It's a good job. Just remind it everybody. Get asked just remind everybody at home that this is a podcast and it's parody and we're protected. Parody parody, 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 parody. Allegedly, allegedly. Yes. Sorry. <laughs> so, but to talk about defense, I mean, that was the seventh minute. Then the eleventh minute, Richarlison took one away, which yes. he was offside, but I mean, it was close. Oh, that and pass by James Rodriguez was sumptuous. It was. It was, and completely did Brennan. Yes. Just all over. And uh, very, very, you know, well played, but very easy for them. So that kind of felt like a big warning sign. But there was a couple of moves. There was it wasn't without positives, I think. That's the thing. Like mm. there was a couple of periods of play. Um, so I think Everton had a passing move where it was maybe like, you know, getting on for ten, maybe more passes in a row, nice sharp movement and and, uh, and moving the ball around with it and then we sort of did a similar we had a bit of a stumble I think Pelle Pessi kind of ran into his man but somehow managed with the ball on the other side but adding it all together it was probably a similar like number of passes Harris put a decent cross in um, unfortunately nobody really got on the end of it but I, I, I just I sort of felt like we were playing our part as the underdogs in a, a fairly enjoyable FA Cup tie you know, as, as a neutral watching it, I would be thinking, no, this is not bad. You know, like as a bit of Sunday night dozing in front of the telly type of <laughs> entertainment. <laughs> I think we were kind of like playing the straight man part fairly well as, um, you know, Everton, who I'm casting in this, as Eric Morecambe in, uh, in this um, <laughs> sort of steal the show. But we were we were there and we were part of it. You know, we were making. You know, it was a it was a fun, a fairly enjoyable thing to watch, and we were we were a factor in the enjoyment. Exactly. Not the, the show. So you come to from your dozing off to find that uh, you know some kind of moments of kind of crumbs of enjoyment from Sheffield Wednesday's play, and you also find some crumbs on your belly that, and you're also overjoyed to find out that you know mm. you've only you've only eaten half the hobnob that's resting on your belly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah maybe a little crumb of roaster a roast potato oh yes excellent crispy uh, um, i thought in particular i thought reach looked at home like you know he didn't look out of place in this uh this setting and uh, i thought he was sort of intelligently moving the ball forward and he sort of as that <laughs> sort of the front man of the of the midfield he does an all right job there but doesn't it just never quite seems to turn into anything it's mm. sort of uh, it's sort of promising but frustrating a bit like the career of of someone like izzy brown um <laughs> but unfortunately we did we did uh we did give in to the weight of chances and 29 minutes in uh gomez sort of toyed with Joey Pelopesi, whipped a ball across the front of the goal and, and Calvert-Lewin was was brave and, and got himself on the end of it um, at the far post to, to score. A, a, a piggy scoring against us, no less. Mm. And the weird BT commentator, I can't remember who it was that was commentating, said, a blade stabbed into the heart of the owls. How oh, beautiful. <laughs> I've got to. I know I, this is broken record territory, but Walt Smith is too close to that front post again. He's hogging it. Yes. He doesn't give himself any chance to intervene mm -hmm. in the cross because he's stood 
touching the the front post the chances the, the as the kind of gamblers you know looking at it in a, in kind of odds terms where that ball is going to end up if gomez manages to get a decent effort off at the near post joe wild smith should be easily able to move enough to cover that mm-hmm. he's right next to it mm-hmm. but by touching it being like almost like having his shoulder on it for security like a, a sort of comfort blanket it, he he opens up <laughs> masses of space and he's asking too much of himself all the time so it's like for the sake of trying if you give up a, 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 a couple of feet at the front post you save yourself having to cover like nine feet to your left like that's just a simple kind of it's angles it's mathematics you know oh physics <laughs> so because he's worried about getting caught out in the short space between him and the near post, mm-hmm. he's completely opening up everything else. Yeah. And he's not quick enough to fill the space or get out to it. So it's a bad decision he's making. Yeah. It's frustrating. And and what did you think he did for that? Because it looked like he just fell over pretty much. Well, basically, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, it's a good ball whipped across. It, it's quick. It is. So it he is. couldn't do anything about it. But if he is, if there's a couple of degrees of separation from him and that front post, he's in a much more um, proactive position to defend the ball coming in. Mm-hmm. He's within a, if you think like, you know, we talk about goal, like how many chances do we say, oh, if it had been either side of the goalkeeper. So where the goalkeeper stands is almost the most important thing about goalkeeping. If you're in the position where it's most likely to go, you know, you're going to look like a good goalkeeper because you can save things that are within a kind of hand's grasp of your body. Mm -hmm. Fair enough? Mm -hmm. (laughs) As as a kind of, you know, I'm theorising here. But, you know, that the space (laughs) that you can mime in (laughs) if you were given to such things, Marcel Marceau, that's your space. That that's where you're strongest. You're most likely to save the ball in those areas. It's going to hit your face, it's going to hit your body, or it's going to hit your hands. That you can move quickly to those places. So it's all about where you position yourself to give yourself the best opportunity. And if you are given, so the post uh, and everything beyond the post looks after itself. You don't need to worry about the space between the post and the player that's striking the ball. So. By standing right on the post, you're giving up a chunk of your savable space <laughs> to uh, you're wasting it and you're mm. limiting yourself to the other side. So I just feel like if he was like a foot away from the near post, he probably could have stuck his foot out and blocked the cross mm-hmm. or 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 had more of a chance of saving it with his hands. But because he was so deep into the his goal mouth, he just it was past him before he had a chance to react. But that is how he's conceded almost every goal we've seen recently, is he goes all the way yeah. to that near post. There's three metres or whatever to hit to the other side of him, and he cannot cover the gap. He's not good enough. He's not quick enough to do it. Mm-hmm. And maybe he would get be- a good shot beats you if you're in the right position, but it's like an okay shot beats you if you're in the wrong position. Anyway. That was the that was sort of the beginning of the end of this, unfortunately. And um, not to sound too, um, not to try and place myself as Nostradamus, but my halftime note, and I did send a text to um, my oft mentioned sister to, along these lines, to to kind of timestamp my prediction. But I said, fairly respectable first half, played our part in a knockabout cup tie. I think this will probably be two or three nil in the end. But if we play as well in the second half, I won't be too disappointed. Mm. that was a big if <laughs> do you have any yeah. other before we kind of close the door on the first half do you have any other bits and pieces um andrew gomez was a very good player i maybe felt mm. it maybe in a different occasion maybe Pelopesi would have defended that would have got his leg to it he did really well in the same position with somebody else like almost immediately afterwards which was strange i can't remember who which player it was maybe it was rich Olsen, but he did a much better job of kind of blocking blocking them off but yeah, he could. I think he could have done better. He was kind of he was bewitched by Gomez's <laughs> uh, dropping the shoulder and stopping and starting. It did. It, 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 yeah, he he bought every dummy he was sold. Sure, but I, uh, you know, again, I kind of agree with you. The main focus of this is Wildsmith, but again, it's it's just. I think everyone involved was just a touch slack. You know, yeah. it's it's difficult with a ball like that coming at that pace 
to defend and you've got a, an attacker like Calvert Lewin attacking that. It it just felt a little bit disappointing to see Burner kind of having that situation. It it felt well, hmm. I I think it maybe is the quality from Everton and those players to just make it seem that from our perspective it looks a little bit disappointing for a number of players. I think you're right. I think Calvert Lewin is is brave in a way that actually you don't often see. Mm. How many chances sort of whip across the goal mouth like that and nobody gets on the end of them? And and you sort of feel like if you'd stuck your foot out or if you'd thrown yourself at it, um, I feel like as fans, we're often in that position. And Calvert-Lewin's put himself there. He, he, he probably knows there's some potential that somebody will crunch him or he'll get tackled, but he's he's wants to get the goal enough that he's, he's put himself out there. It's just a shame we don't have anybody else mm. showing that same level of commitment I guess but uh, I would say a bit of a theme of the game unfortunately was was Burner letting us down defensively yeah Burner and Brennan is a pretty it's a pretty uh I thought Brennan was not too bad actually I I think he, to be honest I thought he was one of the few Wednesday play- we'll, we'll get it to this in the um mm. you know, we, we'll we'll get a, to the kind of autopsy of, of our performance sure. again. but I personally I thought Brennan was one of our better players but that, that's interesting that you were of the opposite persuasion i don't know it's just it's strange to look at though because it's like we don't know that's where where the real the real youth is coming into play is in that you know in that defensive picture yeah and they're up against some incredibly tough players like i, I don't know if it's easier i mean it's easy to say because we didn't score you know, we didn't really lay yeah. much of a thing, lay much of a glove on Everton, which is kind of understandable considering, like, it's pretty much nearly their first team, bar probably their goalkeeper being changed out for Pickford. That's right. I think, yeah, I do believe that's the only kind of change from their their usual line. But I uh, maybe I'm just being too wise after the event. But maybe maybe having a more senior kind of backline would have helped in this. Um, maybe again, it's that problem of. I feel, but maybe on the flip side of that, I can probably agree with you. Maybe it's that difficulty of having Burner as one of the defensive partners. He he needs to be with someone who's a bit more organised, a bit more tactful. Yeah, I don't. It was interesting because Burner. It was weird. It's weird to come out of that and say like a centre back's best moments were in the opposition's half. Like, but Burner's highlights were. He had a couple of marauding runs in the game, <laughs> and that was sort of the good stuff for him. Mm. Um, but I just thought defense, it felt like we were back, unfortunately, back to the old because he's had a real turnaround burner, but mm. it, it felt like we were back to the old one. It felt like a, a bit of the, the bad monk era of burner, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I, I mean, for the first half, I mean, I, I thought it was a fairly valiant effort in the face of a pretty predictable hiding you know yeah. i mean looking at the everton lineup and probably with a team of their kind of standing and stature they're pretty much looking at the trophy and thinking we might as well this might be the only thing that they kind of really have to play for which more this season has been I, said yeah it was said before and after the game yeah. actually by Duncan Ferguson. <laughs> it's it's a strong it's a strong premier league right now i mean in terms of that kind of looking at that title picture but everton are definitely a top half team but not they're not in that criteria for a top four side despite the fact how well they're doing under you know An- Ancelotti so yeah I did, but again it, it just we were doing okay I, I thought that again we'll probably come up with that quality but it felt like maybe we were our own kind of enemy and, and just kind of we seemed to just throw the ball away near the end the final ball was always yeah. a bit missing yeah. Um, I was chatting with my eldest brother, Andy. He was absolutely hating on Adam Reach in the middle of the park. Right. He just kept, kept losing the ball. Some of my pithy kind of comments. I love the moment where Patterson was running up and jabbed his digits into Olsen's ribs. <laughs> that was worth my subscription fee for this, <laughs> for this week of this. This is fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> the, the commentators on my feed were very, very generous to Wednesday. Which right, was that's kind nice. of nice, but they they also had they didn't have the decency of you, Rich, to basically say that Everton have Spurs in the next round because they were like, well, you know, whoever wins this could go on to play, you know, Wickham or Spurs in the next round. And like, well, 
I also enjoyed, you know, they they uh, also kind of love the the pirouette from Bannon. Oh yes, pirouette out for a cold kick as well. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> It, the the first part of it was brilliant. The last part of it less so. You know, <laughs> didn't stick the landing. It's interesting so about Adam Reach because yeah, so I that's maybe a, a different, a, a slightly more negative take, but maybe it's the same sort of thing we're feeling or seeing is that he gets the ball and there's a kind of there's a level of competency, but then it just never seems to turn into anything. So I suppose you could probably that. If you you could characterize that another way and just say keeps giving the ball away, but I thought again this was a day where Bannon had a couple of clutch moments and didn't didn't do well enough with them. In particular, there was one early on in the second half where Windass had spun in behind uh, between their right back and between Coleman and uh, whoever the right sided centre back was. I think it's Mina and Bannon like underplayed the pass to a, a horrific extent, to the point where he just basically passed it to Coleman. And he did apologise to Windass. It's rare to see Bannon apologise, but you, you know he's really dropped a howler when he apologises. Um, yeah. Just, but even that is kind of like clutching at pretty miserly straws. There weren't there weren't that many big opportunities and moments for Wednesday, but we didn't produce a set piece of any note. And often, that, often that's Bannon taking set pieces... Did you that that was to the corner towards the end of the game where Bannon kind of like there's an it was a new signal which was him kind of like waving both hands in the air like a drowning man. Did you like that? No. Uh and he just played it to the front post like every other corner. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear, sorry. Yeah. Drowning 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 man equals won't beat first man. Yes, yeah. Gotcha. I didn't know what the signal was supposed to indicate, but yeah, it just it really didn't mm-hmm. didn't produce a different sort of corner than he usually does. So, sort of getting into the second half, this is where we apparently to even hang on the coattails of Everton, it was a huge effort because we looked knackered second half. <laughs> we we looked done from the from almost moment one. I thought at 60 minutes, uh, you could substitute anybody mm. because we just, yeah, we just looked like we'd run our race. I, particularly the young left back, Coleman just was doing whatever he felt like at any moment for the whole of the second half. Galvin had just was just pooped. Again, maybe a, maybe a factor was that he got no help from his senior partner to, you know, in, in Burner. But um yeah, he just looked, for want of a better word, he looked shagged and they all looked a bit tired. Mm. And it was just became chance after chance there. So Calvert-Lewin had a had a decent effort, which Wildsmith saved well onto the post. Was it from the resulting corner or was it later on? It was a different corner, wasn't it? There was a run of corners then where we kind of escaped a couple mm. of good chances. We got it just about clear and then immediately there was another sort of, uh, I think it was a Sig- Sigurdsson shot was deflected over the bar. And then they then they had the corner that they scored their second goal from. It was 59th yeah. minute. A good corner, lots of movement, and Richarlison got free uh, and got a, got an easy header. It was one of those. I mean, he was so close. The only sort of save that might have been produced was if it had, you know if it hit the person in the goal or one of the defenders. Um, it was it was a sort of flick down into the goal that 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 um, Richarlison carried off. On the commentary, and I think to be fair, in in the uh, first look on the video, it looks like Pelupesi. He was Pelupesi's man, and Pelupesi failed to deal with Richarlison. But I was, I'm, I'm not going to say bored enough to look back. But there is a period of the game where my only note is loads of subs, and during that period, I kind of rewound to watch the corners back. He was Reach's man because I thought it was weird. Richarlison is good at heading the football, and I thought. That would be a really bad decision to put Pelu Pessi one on one with Richarlison. Well, he wasn't. Reach was supposed to be his man, but Reach lost him and just kind of watched him go into the crowd whilst vaguely pointing in his direction. Pelu Pessi was on a kind of zonal duty, so I guess he didn't mark his zone or didn't sort of manage his zone as well as he could have. But the the real culprit was was Adam Reach. It was a pretty pathetic effort when you actually watch 
<laughs> watch it back. But a lot of good movement. It was clever. I had actually genuinely had to watch it three or four times to pick out which one was Richarlison because two or three times I was watching a player and I was like, no, 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 they've run past it. <laughs> <laughs> Any thoughts on that second goal? I mean, it's, it's, it's such a great delivery from the corner. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't know if the excellence of the movement makes it look easy to the point that I'm saying that feels like poor marking. I know. It was. I think it genuinely was poor marking, but it... I think they worked to make <laughs> to find the gaps in our in our defense as well. And then that that goal was joined pretty closely by another. Yeah. Again again preempted by and we've got to be fair where we can another good Wildsmith save. Getting a finger on a very decent effort by Richelson to just touch it around the post was 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 a great save. <laughs> but then th- this is a this was a much simpler corner just Burner got sold a dummy by Mina. Mina pretended he was running forward, checked back. Burner kept running forward, and Mina had a free header. Their mm. best header of the ball had a free header, and I would say it was almost a almost a Chris Linesy sort of floaty corner. But when you are, I think Yerry Mina is six foot four. When you're six foot four and unmarked, a floaty corner is a lovely, lovely corner for you. You will gobble that up <laughs> like so much dinner on a plate. Um, <laughs> Interestingly or ironically, both those corners had a feature of, you know, we talked when Pulis joined about the Pulis or Pulis corner. You kind of faint that you're running to the near post and then make hay in the gap that's left. Both of the, the both of their sort of corner routines, they did that thing where they sort of charged the front post. Most of our team followed them or lost them on the way there. <laughs> And it left loads of gaps and opportunities for when the ball actually was delivered right in the middle of the goal. There was several people could have, that second one, there was about three of them could have headed in Mm. with uh, very little attention from Wednesday. (sighs) Disappointing. Yeah. The the kind of, I'd I'd say, you know, let's be generous, a spirited first half performance. But within 15, 16 minutes of the restart, it uh, it was done. Yeah, well, I, I felt that I, I I felt so sad in saying this. In that, my note after the second half, you know, Windus comes on for Green. Mm. By the way, uh, what did you what did you think of Andre Green in his first first bur- starting berth for Sheffield Wednesday? He, he had a shot, didn't he, at early doors, which was which was okay ish. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I I thought he looked sharp and then faded very very quickly. I don't know what what did you think. Probably the same, you know, had some, I think there's definitely more levels to him. Yeah. You know, he, he definitely felt that, uh, I definitely felt that he didn't really get going in this, yeah. in this occasion. So yeah, I think there's more to come. I think it's difficult to not play football for, for what, seven, eight months, well, seven, that's six, it, six, it? Yeah. six months, whatever it is, and then come in and then be picked for up front against an incredibly strong Everton team without barely any without barely any training, so I thought that was fair. Yeah. So that was, you know, I noted that Windows came on for the halftime point, but I I said at that point, which felt very damning, felt very tempting fate. Sorry, that this is not quite a depressing formality that we've come to expect. <laughs> I said a mild paddle into the shallow end of the pool of predictability. No yes. need for water wings for this trip to the pool. <laughs> And then suddenly we are, it's two we'll goals. Drown. <laughs> yeah, it's two goals in three minutes, 59 yeah. and 62. Yeah. And at that point, then it, it's feeling really, really real kick in the teeth. Because at that point, I think all of the positives of the games have kind of been sapped out and removed. It's like a liposuction of any positivity. And, and you know, noting that Everton are on point for obligacy free will win, we're still 30 minutes to go. It felt yeah. like more were coming at that point. It did. It really did. It was one of those where I was, I'm, this is a weird thing to say, but I'm sort of glad it was three. I suppose it's not that weird to say, but I'm glad it wasn't more because it did start to take on that feel that this could be an absolute cricket score. Yeah. And remembering the way that that, that Man City thumping had, had a hangover effect on the team. Um, that was Stuart Gray, wasn't it? I think so that seven nil. Mm, mm-hmm. um, it, it took us like four or five weeks to get over that properly. I think, 
And I just was worried. It was so, those two goals in the second half were so easy. And I just, we've talked before that this, that it's this little modicum of, of faux confidence we have. It's not, you know, it almost doesn't feel real enough to believe in mm. in and of itself. Um, so like we're trying to build <laughs> a sustainable sort of level of momentum for the remainder of the season on 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 you know kind of this this faux pearl of <laughs> of mm-hmm. confidence mm-hmm. Um, and I just started to feel like oh my goodness if this is a five or a six there's going to be a lot of devastated players out there and and you know we will go into this ridiculous run of games you don't want that so I'm so I'm really in a way I'm thankful for the for the fact that sort of mercifully. Everton seemed to really just take their foot off the gas at that stage. We also made lots of changes, which maybe would have obscured, if, if it had gone <laughs> down that negative route, it would have obscured quite the sort of brutality of it. Mm. I th- yeah, I th- to be honest, I don't. That now we are in the loads of subs bit, so there was just loads of subs from both teams. We, um, they, we made they five. Baby, baby man, child, didn't they? Man child, yes. Thierry <laughs> Small. Thierry Small. Was Thierry Small? No. No, he wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so we we were so we did the halftime change, which meant we could make have a, another three sets of substitutions in the second half, because oh. this new rule set is uh, no but three different opportunities. like this, you've got three times you can make substitutions. So we made four substitutions, we did it in three different slots. We took the maximum. Do you know what I mean? No, we we made five substitutions, Rich. Oh, five substitutions, yeah. But but we did it in we did it in three slots in the second half. So the first one at half time doesn't count. You get three extra they, to so that the new the extra substitutions don't affect the game. You're only allowed three times you can make substitutions. If that makes right. sense, right? Okay, but it's absolute nonsense because that means six times in the second half, people made substitutions. So what I don't know what we've gained from the rule change is what I'm saying because okay. we had subs we had subs at 60 minutes subs at 67 subs at 68 subs at 76 subs at 80 and subs at 85 like what have we I don't understand I don't it's no. weird it, no. it's it's weird that this there's an extra little bit of enforcement and it's weird that this competition has it the Premier League doesn't we had VAR mm. today but yeah. Uh, it wasn't consulted at all. Um, I don't know. It's just, it's strange what football has got itself into with seemingly kind of making up rules on the fly and changing mm-hmm. them as they go. <laughs> but yeah, sorry, we did make the fu- the full, fully allotted five subs today. So we did the Windass for Andre Green. We did Brown and Penny came on between the goals. Uh, which was yeah they were I mean they were getting ready to come on by the time we conceded the second wasn't that the yeah. case oh no they came yeah. Yeah, yeah sorry they did come on just afterwards we saw them on the bench and I said oh look good we're looking forward to a disappointing appearance from uh, Izzy Brown again um I think what I think the word you were looking around saying about the the mixtures of rules and yeah. laws across competition. I think I think the word you're looking for is, uh, it is wank. <laughs> yes, that's that's a pretty good word. Mm. We got to see Fizzy for a little bit. I don't. I think he touched the ball once. Yes. Maybe twice. Yes. Uh, Matt Penny came on as well. Yep. As did uh, Jack Jack Marionette. Jack Marionette. Oh, and someone had stolen his sausages. <laughs> Do it. So I've got just in terms of like remaining notes. Mm. Um, I thought Godfrey was maybe lucky to just get a yellow for his foul on. Um, I'm trying to think who he fouled now. Was it was it Penny he fouled? I thought that was that was a bit nasty. Oh no, it was Harris he fouled. He had fouled Harris, and it was one of those where it's like that's not a million miles from the sort of thing Shaw got sent off for a couple of weeks ago. Because he mm. clearly lost the ball, he was late, and he went with stud showing. I suppose he was controlled, but if you're controlled and you do the person with your studs, is that not worse than being uncontrolled and doing them with your studs? 
we had a terrible corner from Brown, a terrible free kick from Brown, a terrible through ball from for Burner from Brown. He almost injured Burner, didn't he? Because he sent Burner on that run, mm. thumped the thumped his through ball straight out of play for a goal kick, and then uh, Burner on his jog back, I think, was there. That's when he went down injured. <laughs> so he almost single handedly broke Burner as well. But it's saying that. Izzy Brown might have been the best player on the pitch for us today. <laughs> wow. Wow. Considering one of my lines here is, God, Izzy Brown is shit. Oh, he was, he was terrible. Uh, but You know the bit I felt I thought the worst was? It, it, in a game of poor decision-making in a lot of areas, the bit where the, the ball was played to him because he was in that kind of left-wing berth, Yes. And he took a touch to spin it round to go towards the byline <laughs> to lose the ball. Yes. What were you thinking? The, the easiest thing to do, I would have done, would be I'll take it inside and I can get it on my right foot. And then, then you know, who knows what happens after that, especially if it's me as a football player who would be terrible. Yes. But I think I would actually do better in that situation than Izzy Brown did. I don't know what he was thinking. Maybe he'd been watching his videos of... Um... Chris O'Grady and he, he had ideas above his station. Maybe that's true. And then I, I don't know how many bad corners, but that one at the death was such a limp corner. It was so such bad. A howlingly awful corner. <sighs> I suppose what I'm not, I, what, I, uh, what I'm alluding to, albeit with tongue in cheek, is he had some of the ball. So just in terms of the percentage of possession, he had, he had 2.3 percent of the ball uh, mm. today and he was only on for half an hour we there are several players that played the whole game that had less than that or more or, or the same amount Harris had the ball just as much in the 90 minutes as uh, as Brown in his time which he which is was our, the most prolific dribbler Luke but I think they must have been counting actual dribbles down his chin because what I don't know what technically a dribble is but I didn't see many of them I wasn't mm. This was not um, Diego Maradona <laughs> knocking it between people's legs. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know quite what constitutes a dribble. Is it walking more than two steps with a football? Because maybe, maybe he did that five times, but I, I'm struggling to count them up. Mm -hmm. Did you think there was anything in the penalty shout? That was sort of almost the last thing, I think. No. No. No, I don't think so. Would have been nice to see a VAR video, though, that they're actually paying attention to it. Of course, this isn't the first time we had VAR because that was in the cup to... We got screwed out of that Chelsea game. We did. We? we did indeed, yes. Oh. And so, uh, again, generous commentators. You know, the, I'm sure yeah. I'm sure we'll have a whip round and put a, put a few <laughs> coins in your hat from the fans of Sheffield Wednesday. The commentators <laughs> are speaking well of us in the way they're telling a young cancer-ridden child that they're impressed with their <laughs> footballing ability and that Barcelona is surely about to make a call. <laughs> Typically summed up by the commentators speaking of the possibility of extra time, just as we enter stoppage time. <laughs> they seem to think uh, we'll be okay in the league. They seem to think we'll survive going on this. The generous commentators. that The generous commentators, yeah. Let's smoke up your virtual ass for the whole game. <laughs> Hmm. <laughs> so, <laughs> in summary, <laughs> I, I, I mean, we knew we were going to lose today. That's yeah. Uh, that's got to be the caveat at the beginning of all this, hasn't it? Mm -hmm. And I suppose that's the, the the kind of lens you've got to view it all through. I thought first half we, as we talked about, we did our bit. I think second half, it's hard to know because clearly Everton did take their foot off the gas after going 3-0 up. So if they'd gone hell for leather for the, throughout the remaining game, that it, I think it could have got embarrassing. But you could look at this, if you were doing a favourable viewing, you could look at this and go, well, outside of a kind of mad five minutes, we, we pretty much held our own against a, a very decent Premier League team. That's the, the positive... You know, the Snapchat filter, <laughs> beaming eyes, blushing cheeks version of, of this this match. But I don't think it's too far off. I don't think it's too deluded to sort of characterise it that way. But definitely helped by the fact, clearly, when, when it got to 3-0, Everton were like, job done. Put your feet up, lads. 
Mm. Apart from Richardson, who looked really, really angry to be taken off. <laughs> I don't know whether he fancied himself for a, a hat trick, maybe. He's a grumpy boy. So any sort of positive standout performers? No. 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 What did you think of... So uh, we t- we've, t- we've talked about Berner and uh, Brennan in that defensive three. What did, what did you think of Urigide as the, the third man in there? It was okay. <laughs> I was quite... Ple- I, I think, again, first half, separate the first half from the second half, I thought he'd had a really pretty good game. I mean, Richarlison is... Or Richarlison is... Mm. He's a real, real talent. Like, he's one of the best players in the Premier League. He's definitely and, up there, yeah. And Uruguide gave him short shrift a, a couple of times in, in very pleasing fashion. There was a bit where he just put on the afterburners and left him, like, feet behind him. It was just a little ball flicked in behind, but it was just quite nice to see. <laughs> and the bit, the, when he stopped him on the halfway line, that was that was excellent and took Richarlison another, about 10 minutes to recover from that. With his grumpy little face, and ju- that was probably my highlight of the game was Uruguay nicking in there and then standing very big and strong so that Richarlison hit him. That and Patterson smashing their goalie. So maybe what I actually wanted to watch was a rugby match, and those two gave me gave me what I was craving. To be honest, more often this is a time of night where I am more often watching American football than uh, soccer, English football, and. Um, Maybe I was just I wanted some big hits still. Mm. <laughs> so you wanted yeah. to um, just see some some people uh, chipping away at uh, giving each other CTE in the future. That's what you want. That's what I was. That's what I was there for, Luke. Well, we also Rich and I did spend the entirety of the first half basically just talking <laughs> about UFC from the previous <laughs> season. So, and, and Rich made a comment that basically we talked through the best bits of the game, and I said that's kind of that's kind of like life, isn't it? Really, <laughs> you spend your youth just messing around, and then you get old, and it's like, oh dear, what happens to all my time? I've wasted my life. Ah, <laughs> uh, it wouldn't be an episode of Different Gravy following a defeat for Sheffield Wednesday without a very sort of depressing coder at the end would it that's 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 what people come here for and once again luke you've delivered thank you so much no worries glad i could be of service <laughs> you know i like to think my performance could be summed up by the gif of arnie's thumb coming up in the air and terminate two as he sinks into the lava <laughs> which when bannon does that indicates he's going to hit the first man with his corner <laughs> <laughs> so I, I guess for the only thing I want to cap cap off this episode is I, I know we brought in the start of this new year we brought in a new system to look over instead of our player ratings and yes. we said that I think for good performances oh yeah yeah pick a man of a match yes. and for bad performances we'd pick a uh, villain of the week or something villain, like villain that. of the week yes yeah, so so where does where does this fall? Because I mean, it's in some ways it's it's not bad. In some ways, it's bad. Well, we've we've said there's no honourable mention in a positive sense, so that makes mm. me think we've really got to look on the on the flip side of that coin and say who was the baddie. And I think, like many a good movie, it was probably the handsome German chap. <laughs> You're saying that Julian Berners the Hans Gruber of this affair. <laughs> yes, very much so. A grinning Hans Gruber. <laughs> and I think that's the episode title as well. Probably. <laughs> Good stuff. Good stuff. Well, awkwardly, we've already done an outro, so I suppose <laughs> we should just stop talking. <laughs> okay. So that sort of brings us to the end of uh, the discussion, Luke. And... We just got a couple of bits and pieces to of, of business at the tail end here. But the first one, I just want to say thank you so much for the, um, I think, an anonymous user who uh, is in Kiverton Park that, that left a five-star review on iTunes. Um, quite often podcasts do say like, oh, re- leaving reviews and uh, subscribing makes a big, big difference. But uh, I hadn't quite felt that firsthand in the way that we did with this one, that, you know, we certainly saw a pickup in the number of 
uh, folks downloading the podcast, which um, is heartening. Uh, also, the praise in, in and of itself is just lovely. Thank you so much um, for your kind words. Uh, if you do enjoy the podcast and you, you're, you're an, an Apple person, um, do feel free to, to pop on and, and uh, leave a leave a, a review. I mean, please only if it's positive. If it's a bad one, <laughs> we will cower away. We are, um, you know, we're terribly. Um... <laughs> I don't know. You know, we're 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 on the whims of of the of things with the with our moods and things like that. Especially at this time with the exactly. world, exactly, right? Yeah. yeah um so yeah please if if you if you have nice things to say we would love to hear them and um if, if you want to formalize that with um with a positive review on on itunes uh it will result in more folks being able to hear the podcast which is uh splendid um so yeah i i i, I you're probably skipping through this bit we won't make this a feature but um <laughs> there's a reason podcasts do this i figured out and uh this is why <laughs> I'd also like to say thank you to the excellent Paddy Jones, uh, New York Owls, as part of the the also excellent Owls America's podcast, which is a fantastic listen if you've never got into as well. So uh, thank you for buying, thank you for buying one of our t-shirts. Uh, we really appreciate that, and it's uh, it's nice to see the word of different gravy and merchandise get out there. So uh, thank you. Mm, yes, thank you so much, and. Uh, UK folks, uh, I, I did drop a, a link uh, we because we've got a, a couple of bits of new, a couple of new designs available. Um, we have been using uh, a particular provider, uh, but they are having a Brexit moment. So uh, I will drop a new link in the, the, the notes for this episode, which will point people towards uh, the Spreadshirt shop, which is still a fabulous uh, destination for for all things different and um of course gravy uh but thanks very much for listening folks and we'll uh, we'll be with you again next week and uh, best to look for all those days and hours in between have fun see everyone you see you <laughs>